The following podcast is a presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Welcome to Staring Into the Abyss. I'm your host, Richard Gerlach. With me, as always, is Michael Patrick Hicks. Hello! And Matt Brandenburg. Hey, ready for a really depressing episode? Yes, and today we're going to be talking about the book that Matt Bartlett said is one of the best new reads he's come across, Negative Space by B.E. Yeager. B.R. Yeager. B.R. Yeager. (laughs) I don't have it in front of me. B.R. Yeager. It's cool. I mean, I, I feel like for the characters that in the book, it would be fine. They weren't yeah. really, they they weren't really cognizant of what's really going on around them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we fuck up names regularly anyway. So um, <laughs> normally we don't do this, but I think we should if for this episode. Before we get started, I just want to put a trigger warning that we're going to be talking about suicide. Yeah, I feel that probably should be a lot. Fun. Like. Yeah. It's going to be a lot. So if suicide is a trigger for you, I would suggest tuning in next week when it's a much more lighthearted episode. But if you think you can manage the conversation, we'd love you to listen in to hear our thoughts about this book. And I think I speak for all three of us and Matt Bartlett. We think it's a really fantastic book that should definitely be read and definitely be discussed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we may not be speaking for Matt Brandenburg, but (laughs) – Yeah, Matt Matt Bartlett, Bartlett. the rest of us agree. <laughs> so, so you can get one Matt B that likes it. Another yeah. Matt B is on the fence. One it Matt balances B. out. It, it totally balances out. It's the cosmic <laughs> nature of entropy and causation. That's right. So there's a, a another Michael H. out there who doesn't like it. Do you know how many fucking Michael Hickses are out there? <laughs> I was I was at a birthday party yesterday, and we decided to watch I Think You Should Leave, that like Netflix comedy show. And I, I, I'm going to say this, and it's going to make Mike mad, but I have to. Uh-huh. There's a skit where it's like they're, they're having like a baby of the year contest, and one of the babies is called Michael Patrick Porkins, and I laugh every time. <laughs> Every time. No, that that doesn't bother me. (laughs) What what does bother me is uh, there is another author, another indie author, who is Michael R. Hicks. He does uh, (laughs) a bunch of sci-fi. He's very popular. Unfortunately, every now and then I get tweets from people telling me how much they loved this book that I did not write. It is by <laughs> that's Michael what you got. That's what you got to send them the link to one of your books and be yeah. like, if you like that book, definitely check out this one. Yeah. For some reason, these really hardcore readers are confused by the differences between Michael R. and Michael Patrick. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> that, that first it. letter is really close. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I don't have that leg on the P. <laughs> Sounds like a being, medical problem. <laughs> right? Well, with all this confusion going on, I ended up watching The Dark and the Wicked yesterday. The new thing on Shudder? Yes. All right. And we have got to get Shudder to start giving us some kind of comps or payments. Heck yeah. I can re- want me to reach out to Shudder? Every we week you are going on about some new Shutter exclusive that just that premiered. too. It's not just me that you yeah. watch. Like the second it lands, you're <laughs> on. What we need to do is tag them in all of our posts, and then eventually they'll maybe somebody there will listen and realize yeah. how much we talk about them. I mean, I um, doubt anyone from there is listening now. <laughs> that could change. That Who could knows? change. We're the so, next big thing in horror podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> A lot if of people already. <laughs> a lot of people really like the dark and the wicked. Yeah, I'm not one of them, but I can see why a lot of people liked it. Um, the plot's pretty much brother and sister go home to their like family home, 
to look after their older sick mother and their father who's like in bed and just really ill and demon shit starts happening. Wait, the uh, demons are shitting? <laughs> no, but like <laughs> demon demon shit so like demons are doing weird shit. Okay. Read my mind. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, how that would be an interesting take on horror is that you move be, into this place and all of a sudden it's just like mere, weird shit. Or, yeah. <laughs> you you uh, walk through a room. It's like, who shit on the rug? This, all right. No one take that idea. That one's mine. <laughs> Bradley, did you shit on the rug? No, mommy, I didn't shit on the rug. It's a demon. It's a demon. <laughs> So if you're a fan of movies, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> if you're sitting on the rug, Bradley, <laughs> stop hitting me with the poo stick. <laughs> the poo stick. Why did you have to give me the dirty Sanchez? <laughs> It'll be like sub zero. You saw the mortal Kombat trailer where he freezes the blood and makes like a blood knife. So it's a shit knife instead. <laughs> yeah. The poo stick. Man, that I love it. <laughs> If you like movies like The Witch or Hereditary or like those slow burn, claustrophobic kind of movies, I could see you enjoying this one. I typically enjoy those movies. And this movie has some really shocking scenes that like I was like, oh, fuck, they're doing that. Overall, didn't really come together for me as a whole. But I still think it's worth checking out because a lot of people love it. It just didn't really work for me. One thing I don't see happening is a endorsement from Shudder after this last bit. <laughs> hey, man. I'm still recommending the movie movies. for people. They're totally going to pay us for advertising about poo sticks. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you know what? They're going to get sick of Gorman in a few months. So. Exactly. <laughs> you know, the stuff we – they would be totally fine. The stuff they have on there. Yeah, it, I mean, did you guys see Fingers? <laughs> no, but you gave us a pretty good description. <laughs> The movie's great. I love that movie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, overall, I'd say definitely check out The Dark and the Wicked if you're interested. I would have liked, like, my biggest issue for me is a lot of stuff happens. And they don't really kind of either foreshadow or they don't kind of give you, let you in on what's going on until, like, the last 20 minutes of the movie. Yeah. So it's like, oh, now it makes sense. But for most of it, it's like, why is what, what's why what's going on? What's this? <laughs> um, well, so it, it has an become, awesome poster. It does. And it has some awesome scenes like this is just a spoiler for some of the scenes. I'll spoil the two scenes that stuck out the most for me. One is early on in the movie when the mother is cutting a carrot. She starts cutting her own fingers. Ooh, oh. and continues to cut her own fingers into her own hand. Jinkies. And just keeps on cutting. Does she notice? And yeah, she notices and she's still doing it. Interesting. Um, All right. And then she hangs herself in the barn with a bunch oh. of sheep. Like with a bunch of sheep? Yeah. The sheep don't hang themselves, but she hangs themselves in the barn. <laughs> hangs herself in the barn. Um, <laughs> it's a line of sheep in her. All right, you guys ready? <laughs> and then the, the uh, near the end, near the end of the movie, the brother decides to go back home to his wife and kids because he's like, we can't help like our father. This shit's gonna happen no matter what happens. We gotta leave and take care of ourselves. And then he goes home, and he goes home to like this country song about Jesus playing. And he walks into the room, like the kitchen, and both of his daughters are there with their throat slit. And his wife is like against the wall with her throat slit and she's holding a bloody knife. And then he like just has a mental breakdown and he slits his own throat. And then after he does that, it was an illusion caused by the demon and the bodies that he saw faded away. And then he bleeds out and dies and his wife and daughters come home to find him in the kitchen. Dang. Wow. And this is all like in the first five minutes of the movie. So you didn't really spoil anything. <laughs> oh, that's close to the end. The first part. Oh, from the first, is. I said the second one. The second one's near the end. Oh, the first you. one. The first one's near like the first five minutes. But there's even more crazy shit that happens between those two things. Wow. Um, I got to say, you weren't kidding about that suicide trigger. I didn't think we were going to be <laughs> yeah. jumping into 
right into it. <laughs> that part of the conversation <laughs> this early in the show. <laughs> yeah, that is that is uh, the the dark and the wicked. It's worth I thought watch. all that was going to be coming up during our negative space. Yeah, oh no, it's coming. It was coming up during Dark and the Wicked. Well, I'm um, really glad then I did not encourage our listeners to just go through the first half of this I, episode. <laughs> I was thinking that too. <laughs> yeah. God um, damn. Yeah, it's 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 a fucking heavy movie. Jesus um, stay for the poo sticks, leave for the suicide. <laughs> <laughs> But Talk about Mike, a sticky situation. <laughs> <laughs> but Mike, anything you recommend from this last week? Uh, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and recommend a- Alex White's new Alien tie-in novel, Alien Into Cherubitis Ooh. from Titan Books. Now, I know in the past, every time we've brought up an Alien book, my recommendation was always to read Alien The Cold Forge, which is the first Alex White book. Yes. And I know Matt didn't care for it after all of that. After all I of did. <laughs> pushing and shoving him to read it, he ended up hating it. So I maybe didn't don't eat my word. <laughs> there was not enough poo sticks. I guess not. So Indu Cherubitis is his new one, which I have been waiting for ever since I finished The Cold Forge way back in 2018. And this book is just in all respects, it's bigger and badder and bolder, and I just fucking loved it. <laughs> nice. What Alex does with this one, he, or they, I should say, take it from a space station base setting from the Cold Forge and moves it entirely planet side onto this very volatile planet that there is an Iranian station on an atoll in the middle of a very violent lake that is just constantly hammering at this atoll. So right away, you're kind of getting like this claustrophobic feeling and this worry that this water is going to somehow come in and flood everything on top of the worries of the aliens coming in and fucking things up. And Alex White kind of plays with the politics of the United America's colonies in space and the integration between the military and Waylon yutani and all the shit they get up to. Nice. And that, the threat of that military-industrial complex. The Iranian colony is part of a breakaway secessionist colony. So right away, United America has declared them like an enemy state. And Iran is relying on these private business Americans to come in and help them install a data hub. And the State Department has warned these American IT guys, like, you know, if you go in there, you're on your own. It's all like our State Department does not recommend this. We don't foresee them as a sovereign nation. We see them as terrorists. So these business guys go to the colony on Cherubitis and help with this. But then things go sideways. And it ends up kind of being a sci-fi riff on the Iran hostage crisis. Oh, wow. And the Americans end up being able to send out a distress signal, which prompts the colonial Marines to respond. And these are not the romantic, idealistic portrait of the colonial Marines that we know from James Cameron's Aliens and a lot of the subsequent tie-in media and other books that have really painted the colonial Marines as being heroic figures This is not that. These guys are (laughs) very hardcore. They're working for Wayland yutani so they've got those dark, dark shadows about them and their motivations for being there. And what are they going to do to try and save these Americans? Or are they going to just let them die because they have a superseding mission that overrides all of that? (laughs) And then, of course, you have the aliens who, as always, are tenacious and violent and very, very hungry (laughs) and looking to breed. (laughs) Nice. So that's uh, Into Cherubitis, which I thought was absolutely fantastic. It's a great follow up to the Cold Forge. And much like when I finished the Cold Forge, I'm ready for the next book. This one ends on a neat little a neat little note of where. Possibly Alex's next book could go, or possibly where Titan Books is going to be taking 
these alien tie-in novels for future authors that could be playing in this world. So I'm curious to see what comes next. It's a really interesting perspective. You know, with all this sucking off of a Titan book, books, (laughs) alien novels, Mike, I think you should pitch him a book. Maybe, maybe we'll see if they want one. Does he, does he tie it to a cold forge? Um, without getting into any spoilers. Yes. Oh, and what about, did you ever, did you read the infestation one? Not yet. Oh, dude, you got to read that one. Was that the one with uh, Tim Wagner? Yes. No. Oh, that's prototype. Or prototype. That's the word. Infestation. I think that's uh, Weston that Oaks's yes. forthcoming one. Haven't got that one yet. Yeah, I haven't read that one. But yeah, prototype is really good. And I don't think that one's tied to either of them, but it has, I think it's tied to some of the, I think it's either tied to the comic or to the game. I one of the think games. it's tied to some of the Dark Horse comics. If I remember correctly, they've got yes. Zulu Hedrix in there. He was yep. an important figure in the comics from, uh, yeah. I, th- I want to say Brian Wood was the author of those comics. Yeah, they're in that. And then they also have uh, Ripley's daughter is in this one. Yes. She's yes. also in the Alien game. Yes. So, but no, that sounds awesome. I'm on board. I've, I like, you know, I've read two of them so far, these newer ones and, I definitely want to read, um, what was it, the F- Phalanix? What was the F- Oh, yeah, yeah. The yeah, Scott Phalanix. Sigler one? Yes. I want to read that one and then this one. So, um, awesome. They are doing an Alien vs. Predator anthology that's due out at the end of the year. And Scott Siegler is writing a short story sequel to Phalanx. Nice. So is that the one that Mayberry's editing? Or did he already do one? Uh, he's done a couple of them. I think he did... Alien Bug Hunt, I think he did yes. the Predator one, and he's back on board with a co-editor, I believe, for this new anthology. Well, that's awesome. cool. All kinds of good alien stuff on the horizon if you're a fan. Yeah, man. Hell yeah. I gotta uh, read those books. I really do. This one, what I really, really liked about it, it's got a lot of commentary and political philosophy, but considering the way he presents these characters, the way the Iranians and the Americans are painted for an alien book. I mean, this thing is fucking subversive as hell. (laughs) (laughs) It's fantastic. It is not what I was expecting from an alien book. So it hit a lot of little sweet points for me. Nice. So Matt, what about you? I am reading Maurice Broaddus's Pimp My Airship. (gasps) Such a good book. I love so, Maurice. It's so awesome. It is for those who haven't read it, which you all should. It's a kind of an alter, alternate history timeline in which America failed the revolution. So we are working with Albion is the, I think is basically a name for United Kingdom. Um, and it, it's kind of this steam steampunk very steampunk heavy world and it is focused on Indianapolis, which is in this book kind of like the cent, maybe not the capital, but it's probably one of the um, biggest cities in the States now and is kind of the, the everything is happening there technology wise and, and just is the experiment for the rest of the country. And it deals very much with class and black versus white um you know there's different class systems so everyone's either a person an unperson or you know you can be kind of higher level up and of course in this story and in this world most of the black people are kind of considered the unpersons which basically means you're untouchable you can't work anywhere um and and people don't want to work be next to you or anything like that. And so it's kind of this terrible title to have, and it's all about revolution. We follow sleepy, who is a poet slash Chiba head, her pothead. And he gets kind of caught up in this revolution of, um, kind of taking down the system with now, I guess 120 degrees of knowledge. Allah, who is this wacky, crazy character who kind of realizes as you go on, he's got a deeper story and he's, uh, definitely part of something bigger. And then, um, Dietrich blues or Dietrich blues, who she is kind of gets thrust into this revolution. Her father is a, was a captain of industry. So she was kind of part of, you know, higher, higher 
group of people and she is a scientist who doesn't like to buy into everything and she gets kind of sucked into this thing and realizes that there's a lot of bad crap happening and it's just it's an awesome book the visuals that uh maurice puts in there i mean like everything from all the steampunk kind of inventions and airships and shit and cars and just everyday little things plus outfits he goes into great detail on what everyone's wearing and it it's kind of awesome to see uh where he's what the people are wearing it's just his really cool suits and dresses and everything like that and it's just it's definitely his flair having seen enough pictures of 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 maurice and just kind of following his twitter account you know he's he he got, he, he has some style and he put that style in this book and it, it's really cool and it i mean like I think this came out last year or 2019. I can't remember when. But about 2019. Okay, 2019. But man, he is on. I mean, this was the book you should have read last year when last summer, just because of everything that was going on in this country. This book like hits it to a point, and it's just it's very powerful. Even even if you're kind of like, man, this title's kind of goofy, pimp my airship. But once you get into it, you're just like, damn, he's He's hitting a lot of points and making a lot of uh, observations that are very accurate mm-hmm. in the, the world today. So it's awesome book, you know, from our friends at Apex. So if you're looking for something a little different and you want something kind of fun, maybe not fun's the right word, but you want something engrossing and um, very topical, Pit My Airship is the way to go. If you if you like Pit My Airship, check out Buffalo Soldier after. Oh, yes. That is definitely on my list. That one in the, his young adult uh, Usual Suspects is also yeah. on my list. Actually, that's a middle grade book, actually. Or middle grade, yeah. I want his, his – he has an urban – like a dark urban fantasy retelling of like King Arthur and Knights of the Round Table set in like Baltimore's gangs and stuff. Oh, nice. And I want that to go back into print so I can finally read it. Yeah, that's um, awesome. No, Maurice is great. I love, I love Maurice. Yeah, it's such an awesome story, and it's fun to like. Not, uh, I'm like probably three hours from Indianapolis. I've been there, and so it's kind of fun to kind of see his version of it. So, yes, it's worth checking out. So, uh, I'm going to recommend a manga surprise, surprise. Oh my god! I did. <laughs> no one saw this coming. Oh my what? god! So, Volume Four of Blood on the Tracks came out last month. And I finally picked it up, and I am not bullshitting you guys and the audience. Like, the, I'm I'm dead fucking serious. I've never been scared by a Junji Ito manga. I've been grossed out by them. I see the suspense. I see the scary imagery. But I've never been scared by a Junji Ito manga. This manga fucking made me shit, almost shit my pants. <laughs> like, not even bullshitting you. And the the story is pretty much, in the beginning, it follows this Japanese young teenager named Seiichi. And his mother is super overprotective. Like, crazy overprotective. And in the opening chapters, they're on a family hike up in the mountainside, and Say's cousin is kind of like horsing around being a dumb shit because they're kids. And the mother, in retaliation to the horseplay, pushes his cousin off a fucking cliff. Oh, jeez. Because she's trying to protect her son. So you had a really lighthearted week yeah. of material yeah. that you were going through really 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 did well this is i read i read volume one months ago and the the manga follows seichi as like he develops severe anxiety and nervousness around his mother from like witnessing what his mother did in front of him and like it it portrays mental illness in like an interesting way because there's something going on with his mom that like her faculties aren't all there, so to speak. And in the last volume, uh, there's his classmate, Fukishi, and she spends time with him and writes him a love letter. And this was the first time a girl noticed him, and I'm pretty sure we all we all can remember that feeling when that happens. <laughs> and um, the mother finds a love letter and reads it, and the mother looks at him, and she's just like, 
that's a really sweet letter. I'm so happy she feels that way about you. And then her demeanor changes and she's like, but only I can love you. You need to rip this letter up. (laughs) And like she forces her son to rip the letter up. And then in this newest volume, Seiichi starts spending time with her, like the, the girl who wrote the note and asks her to be his girlfriend. And they start spending time in secret together. And every time he comes home, it's always later than he should be. So the mom's asking suspicious and he always smells like he has perfume on him. And the mother's like, you smell nice every single time. And there's like one scene where they're like sitting together on a bench and the girl asks, say, to like rub her hair pretty much. So he starts doing that. And then the background, you see the figure of a woman riding a bicycle saying, I see you. (laughs) And that's the mom. And she starts getting closer, saying, I see you, I see you. And I'm like, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, I almost shit my pants when that happened. I'm not even going to lie. Like, that actually, like, scared <laughs> me. It's a really solid, like, psychological thriller with, like, murder mom and anxiety real kid. And the artwork, like, I, you remember that picture that I sent you? I think I only sent you the I see you picture. But like the this is one of the few mangas that is hand drawn. Everything's digital now. But this one's hand drawn. So like there's one part where it's like a close up of the mother's face and she's crying. And the drawing is done through like lines to like show us that it's nighttime and the shadows on her face. And the tears are made by having like lines not being filled filled in all the way. To like have the white space represent tears. It's a really cool art effect. Hmm. And like the, the dude's a really good artist. And next volume will come out next month. So far, there's been 10 volumes altogether, but I know it's still ongoing. I'm not too sure how long it's going to run for because Sujo Oshimi is the as the author. His stuff typically doesn't go super long, but he'll right until he finishes the narrative he's trying to write. And unlike when you think of manga, you think of like Dragon Ball Z where it's like, here's one arc, here's a second arc, here's a third arc. Like he just focuses on the, focuses on the story. It's so like once his core story is done, he's done. Um, but it's, I highly recommend it. If you want to try like horror manga, this one is probably the scariest one I've read. And I know Junji Ito gets a lot of dick sucking in the horror scene. <laughs> I'm vulgar today. Just a little bit. <laughs> well, good on Junji Ito. Congratulations. <laughs> hey, man, you know what? I'm ha- I'm happy for him, too, because I've been reading Ito since high school. Like, no shit. Like, no joke. I've been reading Ito since I was like 14 years old. <laughs> and now now he's getting the credit that I was giving him all those years ago. So I'm super happy for him. Yeah, but at the same time, there's so many other people doing really great stuff that I think need eyes on their work as well. This is true. But uh, anything else in your end, Mike? Uh, no, that's it for me, Matt. How about you? Wow. Well, oh, gonna oh. continue on our discussions of WandaVision. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Not the hit Vision no. suck fest begins. Heck yeah, we're not. All right, we're on our way through it. We might as well continue finish. And we're one like episode what? Left. Yeah, one episode left. Um, you know, I really liked it. I, it answered some questions and it left some bigger ones out there. And so, what? I'm, Did you cry? No, no, but that was a very touching moment. It was very sweet. But I kept my problem was because I'm cynical and and everything was I just kept focusing on the fact that they were they had to weave around the fact they probably couldn't get any of the other (laughs) superheroes into the movie (laughs) or into the show. So they they had to do these scenes. But it was a very touching scene. I do. I do appreciate it. But what I kept trying to figure out and like we kind of knew, but the whole concept of Agatha all along, which is a very popular song at this time is that it really wasn't her all along. Like, I feel like this song kind of like, I mean, I know she was just trying to figure out what Wanda's how Wanda was doing it, but she was controlling people inside the town, but the whole town was Wanda's thing. Exactly. But like it it just, the song when you have it, having listened to it multiple times, 
posits that Agatha set this whole thing up and that everything happening was due to Agatha. But this se- episode makes it seem like, yeah, she did some little things to draw out Wanda's magic, but this this wasn't her business. This was somebody else's, which we still don't know who it is. So that was the only part where I was kind of like, oh, man. And then that and the whole fact that Pietro, like, that was just some cheesy stunt casting and had literally nothing to do with everything we all hoped for. Well, I will there, say – oh, Mike. I was going to say there's still a chance it could go sideways when you consider Doctor Strange 2 is going to be called the Multiverse of Madness. Yeah. And if all the casting for Spider-Man has – if those rumors are true about having – Characters from the Sony Spider-Man movies with uh, Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield and their villains coming in. I mean, there's still definitely some possibilities that this could get pretty fucked up with her chaos magic abilities. True. So So we might still see some of that. What I don't understand is how they're going to wrap this all up in one more episode. Yeah. Yeah. Unless yeah, it's, it's be... like a feature length finale, because they need a big super sized episode to get through this if next yeah. week is the last one. But there was a casting agency that tweeted that one of their one of the actors they represent has at the time they tweeted it was going to appear in episode seven, eight, nine, and ten of WandaVision. Hmm. And then that post mysteriously disappeared probably after Marvel found out about it. (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean, who would that be? Who is in seven, eight, nine, and 10? I think it's, uh, one of the soldiers that works for, uh, the, uh, the Latin American (coughs) soldier, that woman that, yes, she was leading the director into the tent. Yes. She's popped up a couple times. I think it's her. Yeah, well, that would fit some of the rumors I heard is that she's a scroll. <coughs> she's one of the scroll leading this. So oh. they said something with her eyes, which I didn't notice. You'd have to like look up on YouTube what they were talking about. But there's something the way she does with her eyes that people were like, "Oh, that's what the scroll did in the movie." So I don't know. Some of these people going <laughs> through this shit like scene by scene, like slow <laughs> through it, like. I spent 10 hours watching this 47 minute episode. Here's all the connections. I will say there, there seems to be like some references to the more supernatural part of the Marvel universe. Yes. Yes. Like in Agatha's basement, uh, all the pillars in her basement had Mephisto's symbol on them. And then they, they mentioned the chaos magic, which the movies have mentioned before. Nope. And even dropping the whole, like, you are the Scarlet Witch. Like, she's someone that's going to be special when it comes to the use of the chaos magic as well. Seems to be suggesting the um, other characters within the more supernatural part of the Marvel Universe. So, like, I'm interested to see how they'll connect that into the regular MCU. Yeah. Yeah. And how this connects in, because that's where it seems to be heading now. And I will say I'm going to be excited for the finale with Wanda's vision. She made out of her energy fighting against evil sword v- vision. Yes, <laughs> that's going to yeah. be fun. That is going to be a fun fight to watch. And I know Kevin Feige did say that WandaVision is going to be kind of the kickoff to phase four. Like This is going to be really kind of setting the stage for what's going to be coming with this phase of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He's only so. saying that because um, Black Widow got delayed. <laughs> but it's still clearly very important to what's yeah, going to be coming when you look at yeah. Spider-Man and Doctor Strange. I think Doctor Strange is clearly going to become a big player moving yeah. forward along with I think, Wanda. I think Doctor Strange is going to be the new Tony Stark. Yes, yeah. I think that's safe to say. He's supposed to be in Spider-Man. He's got a sequel to his movie coming out next year with Wanda co-starring. So, yeah. And especially because Doctor Strange is like the protector of the realms. Yeah. yeah. It kind of makes sense that like if they're going the multiverse route, it makes sense that Doctor Strange should be the forefront of that. Yeah. Yes. Definitely. And there's some speculation that Wanda will be responsible for creating mutants. So. Yeah. 
We'll see. I don't know about that part, but yeah, I'm right. I want they need to hurry up with Fantastic Four. I want <laughs> I want to get the ball rolling on that one. Yeah, indeed. We'll see. Well, so the big before we get into it, the two questions that are that I we've been discussing since this episode's come out is. Is the title Scarlet Witch, like, is that something that gets passed down? Because the way she said it made it seem like it's like a, you know, like a title that they've known. Or is it like a a myth of like some person being a Scarlet Witch? Both, maybe. So like, yes. So kind of like the one from Matrix. Yeah. She's like the, the Keanu Reeves for the MCU. Yes. Okay. Because that's what we were trying to figure out with like that name, and then the fact that she saw the image in the Mind Stone. We're like, well, is this like a like? Has there been more than one Scarlet Witch, and she's just the newest one, or is it kind of like the Matrix, where the one is like this rumor, this myth, and now she's the one? So I'll tell you, when she touched the Infinity Stone and she had that vision, that gave me a whole lot of flashbacks to the Phoenix. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. So this is them. I like, yeah. Trying to, Only this, this is Marvel suck. trying to redo it. Yeah. <laughs> and then the other thing is who sent that, uh, the deed to the house. Mm, mysterious. Wasn't that, wasn't that like, well, it was in her car, but it looked like vision had already bought it. Yeah. yeah. They were, he was starting to build the house. But yeah. Th- but why that town? Why not? <laughs> Come on. We saw that town. <laughs> Out of all the places they could pick, it's, it's a fixer quiet. upper. It's closing down. It's a fixer upper. <laughs> I mean, the real estate was probably cheap. I mean, he probably got it for a dime after the invasion. Yeah, because <laughs> definitely the Avengers are worried about money. We- <laughs> I mean, imagine they don't show after- us that movie where they're all broke. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, imagine after the snap, how much property values must have plummeted. Like you had. <laughs> For five years, you've got this excess of housing and no buyers. <laughs> yeah. He probably got that house for a nickel. Yeah, but he he bought it five years ago. <laughs> True. Or maybe it was the first thing he did when he came back. Oh, no, because he didn't. <laughs> he no. Didn't all right. Yeah, back. you're right. So, yeah, he wasn't snapped, was he? Uh, no, he was. He like had that. his head crushed. He was yeah, dead. So dead. I guess it must have been. Okay. Well, I don't know. Maybe it was uh, the recession from 2008 or <laughs> Trump's economic collapse. I don't know. I'm just spitballing here. They're hanging out in Scotland and they're like, you know what? We really need a home in Westview, New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen pic- pictures of that blown down, that beat up place and it looks perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely don't want to stay in beautiful Scotland. No, they can just blend in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I- I'm curious to see how they're going to wrap this all up, though. Yeah, definitely. I'm because this show, like, it's been unexpected moment after unexpected moment. Yes, and I've been pleasantly surprised by yes. by this show. I I've been enjoying it a lot. So I I have my questions, and hopefully they'll answer them in a in a way like you said. I, there's no way they can capture that all in a 40 minute episode. Yeah. Well, I think what they're gonna do is they're gonna end it on some kind of cliffhanger. And then it'll be Wanda will return in Doctor Strange 2. And then that's where it's going to pick up. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, yeah that, I could see that happening. But uh, I think we had enough beating around the bush. And yeah. we should probably bite into the whirl and yeah. uh, <laughs> chew those leaves. And yeah, discuss so negative, who's, negative space. <laughs> yes. Who's ready to talk about suicide? Oh, man. I mean, I'm like, right. Hey, so far. Just like a dirty, beat up town, and everyone is just like the worst. It's Westview. <laughs> it is, yeah. It Westview, is Westview before the hex. <laughs> All right. So, negative space, we have a bunch of teens who are led by the sociopath Tyler. I yeah. think it's fair to call Tyler a sociopath. Yeah, I would say that's fair. You have <laughs> probably the polite way to refer to him. Yeah. Uh, you have Amir, who sees himself as Tyler's best friend. You have Jill, this kind of like pretty much Tyler's Jill lover. has a crush on Tyler. But yeah. I was trying to I was trying to like describe her background because it's kind of weird. Uh, you have Lou, who is a trans trans woman who no one 
pays respect to. Except Jill's the only one who's nice to Lou until yeah. she's not anymore. Yeah. yeah. But even when she's not, when she's mad at Lou, she still like respects Lou, whereas everyone else doesn't respect her. Jill never throws anything in Lou's face. Yeah. yeah. And it follows these three people and their relationship with Tyler and drugs. A lot and of drugs. Su- and suicides. A lot of suicides. Uh, we have a story pretty much about a group of teens coming of age, abusing substances they should not be abusing. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> what this fucked up society is doing to them. Yeah. And, and if that book sounds like a book you'd enjoy reading, I highly recommend it because it is a really <laughs> good fucking read. But yeah, it's I mean- heavy. <laughs> it's not often that you get a cosmic horror story that has this much drug use and teen suicide has yeah. linchpins to it. You know, I mean, this is definitely not your Lovecraftian cosmic horror story of people fearing the unknown. I mean, these are kids who are very much embracing that unknown in order to escape from the drudgery of their daily lives. Right. Pretty well, much. And like, I think to it, you have all of that, but it's almost like a commentary on kind of, um, I don't want to say coal mine, but you know, those like busted towns that the big, you know, big factory or a big warehouse. Towns? That, yeah. It's just yeah. this destroyed town that you like, he, they throw in all of these little bits of like, Oh, there's dead animals on the street and all the places are busted up and broken and people are just, you know, you have the suicide that's sort of tied to possibly this cosmic entity thing, but also just people not happy anymore and these yeah. burnt out houses and, and like so it's not like a pretty town and it's not like a, a safe town. And so it almost feels like that kind of commentary on what the this group of kids in this type of town, what ends up happening to them and just like that life. I mean, they, they add in the, the kind of cosmic stuff too, but if you kind of look past that, it's like a very deep commentary on just what happens to somebody in a town that you're, you're destined to go nowhere. I mean, all of these people, all of these teens, they, they're either their parents or them. They're just clearly destined to rot in this little town. Yeah. It's very much a depression kind of town. I mean, the depression works on multiple levels here with the characters. When we open them, when we open the story, Jill and Tyler are meeting at like a psychiatric hospital, like a a group meeting. I think they've all tried to kill themselves and they've all been admitted to this hospital and they have to talk about what they're going through. But even outside of that hospital, I mean, like you said, the whole town is ruined this is like a depression era town it's a rundown rust belt kind of place whatever businesses it had have fled it's just people who are barely making it it's a very you get the impression it's like a very low income rundown kind of place very economically depressed along with psychologically depressed and how all those come together and the teens who are trying to escape from that through drug abuse and other things. scarring, cutting themselves, going and through like, self mutilations and calling into some power that yeah isn't and there. Nobody really knows what Tyler's up to. He's addicted to this drug called Whorl, which is kind of like a tobacco chew, but yeah. not. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. like a dip. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's but like, more psychotropic than your usual stuff you go and buy at the corner store. Yeah. It yeah. kind of opens up your your eyes to things you may not see in the waking worlds. Is this yeah. book – Is this when did this come out? Is this brand Last new? Last year. Last yeah, year. I think it came out like October or November, so it's very recent. Okay. Because I was wondering if that was kind of a little bit of a comment on – because I know there was bath salts. And then what was the other thing that started with an S? Stevia or whatever? Do you remember Is that? Uh, maybe that there was stuff that they were selling at like everywhere and it was supposed to be somewhat like weed, but not like weed. And Salvia? then they, me, yes, that's it. I was wondering, <laughs> I was wondering if that was this, like a comment on that. Like, I, I thought Stevia was like a sugar. 
I think <laughs> I was thinking salvia. <laughs> yeah, man, they sell all the sugar. It's great. It's like pixie sticks. Do lines off the counter. Yeah, you get all these teens snorting Splenda and shooting up agava. <laughs> I really need it. <laughs> Oh, man. Um, but yeah, I, I was wondering if it was that because this world stuff, like, I mean, they sell it everywhere. And then eventually we find out that they stop selling it. But like, clearly it what I was trying to wonder with that is not only are they selling it everywhere and Tyler uses it for these like rituals. But like, did he like was he the who t- like who tied those two together? Or were they always tied together? Well, they are tied together, but it seems like it's kind of a limited knowledge Kind of like Tyler somehow got into it. Well, we know by the end how he got into it. But as far as like later, late in the book, when Joe goes to college, she meets up with a girl who is practicing these similar occult rituals as Tyler. And it isn't really explained how she learned about it. So I don't know how I don't think it's something that's widespread, but I mean, it very well could be. Yeah, We certainly get enough indications as the story progresses that if it isn't Tyler directly, then whoever else is using this drug or these other groups that are using this drug are having some kind of an effect on yeah. the town and the people there. Like, I almost wonder if it was made there. There's that whole what the abandonments, which I don't know if they said what that was happening. It's like a like a neighborhood that kind of got bl- burnt out or st- shut down or something but yeah. like i wondered if that was kind of like if the abandonment was tied to you know like how they build communities around like a, a big business if that was kind of what their deal was and when that business shut down then the abandonment shut down though that's yeah. the, the abandonments were super weird anyway so that was my impression yeah because i kind of picture this as being a factory town and yeah. so when the factory closed the people that lived in the abandonments had to go elsewhere Things I really liked about this is one we have like it, the story kind of jumps between everyone's the three three heads and so like we get a little heading you, you, chapters are chapters but within the chapters you kind of it tells us who we're jumping into but we never jump into Tyler so we never know fully what his deal is I mean we have a pretty good idea but we don't know um, everything that he is what his plan is and what he's trying to do. And, and I also liked the, he kind of, we kind of get out of the, there's a lot of message board stuff at the beginning and then that slowly mm-hmm. dissipates. But I like I really that. like the message board stuff. Yeah. It's like this message board that's pretty much just tied to all the suicides. So everyone, when a suicide happens in town, it's almost either people in this little message board knew that it was going to happen or they shared a pictures of what happened. Um, and so it, it's kind of this nice little touch. It's Lou definitely uses it a lot. We kind of get some pretty strong hints that Tyler's in there because, you know, it's a message board. So everyone's name is not who they are. Well, but Tyler, th- there is a screen name that he ends up later referencing in one of his songs. Yes. So I am fairly certain that that is Tyler posting on the board. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Definitely. Along with Lou and Crazy Bob. Crazy Bob. <laughs> Crazy Bob. <laughs> Yeah, Lou is like the most tragic character in the story, I think, too. Yeah, her background is it's pretty heartbreaking the way her parents deal with her. That's some really hard stuff, too. Yeah, it's so crazy. With. So like, crazy, parents, too. Ugh, they're just shit bags. <laughs> yeah, because like we get this pretty like Lou is grade A student and it's always, you know, doing homework and doing all these things. Um, she definitely uses the message board, but she's like. She doesn't do a lot of, at first, a lot of bad – she's just a good kid. But, man, one little tiny thing and her parents are just like, you're the worst. You're killing everybody and all this stuff. You're locked up. And it's just like, geez, the pressure they put on her is just intense. It was neat the way that they did Lou because at first you're not sure because it's – I mean, the name is Lou, so it it can go – However many different, and I know they they did this on purpose. Um, yeah, so they could they could use Lou like L O U and then L U. Yeah, and so it kind of like you, get, it's kind of step into that because Jill definitely calls her Lou L U, and then you I think it's 
either Jill's mom or Jill's dad. Somebody references her as Lou L O U, and you're like, oh, okay, I get this. And it kind of like showing us this little history with Lou and giving us more context on her story, especially as we keep going. Yeah, the pronouns for Lou shift depending on perspective and how those people relate to them. Like Lou's parents do not view Lou as a woman. Lou is their son, L-O-U, and they are absolutely appalled that Lou is transgender. And they do everything they can to try and tear that relationship with their child apart. Yes. But yeah. Jill is very accepting of who Lou is and always refers to her as she because and that Jill's is the, Lou's preferred pronoun. Jill's the only one who refers to Lou that way. Yeah. Because well, even then, Amir is like, Lou's that weird guy. I was but trying I to remember. Amir, Amir will use the proper pronouns in front of Lou, but when Lou's not there, Amir's like refers to Lou as this weird guy. Well, Amir's kind of a jerk. Too. Yeah, Amir's an asshole. He's just like... <laughs> Like, what was it, Amir and his sister when they go to uh, the party or whatever? Yes. <laughs> God. <laughs> he's such a fucking ass. Uh, throughout all of it, he he's a jealous, lonely boy. And he is. <laughs> he loves Tyler, and he hates that anybody else would be even near Tyler. And Yeah, he's yeah. supremely jealous of Jill. And I, I, think, and Tyler. I think him and Tyler should just make out and get it over with. Well, they definitely do make oh, out. They, oh, yeah, they oh, do. more than once. <laughs> they do. But I mean, like, then it kind of stops. But I think they, they should just, they deserve each other because they're both shit people. Yes. Yeah. Well, we see at the end when they end up sharing an apartment together after Tyler has become <laughs> a drug dealer, basically. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Gets yeah, it, Amir into deep trouble with the 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 boss of uh, yes. selling mm-hmm. this illicit world after it's been banned. Yeah, it definitely uh, the, pokes a few holes in their relationship. I mean, and I guess to step back, so it starts with them all in their junior year of high school and them just kind of figuring out high school. People are committing suicide, which the Ty- book describes in graphic detail, by the way, uh, very much. It does not. It doesn't, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, sensationalize it. It makes it very like, this is what happens. Yeah. I don't know if sensationalize is the right word, but you know what I'm talking about. I like, it's I like not the, exploitive. Uh, yeah. It's not exploitive. I like the scene, was it before the school year starts when there's the suicides on the football fields? Oh, man. Oh, yeah. so that, that was intense. So Tyler and Amir, they're kind of these punky loser kids. And of course, it's high school, so you got the jocks. And you got these fake redneck jocks and there's a, a com- there's like what two confrontations. Tyler and Amir are up and their their other friend, which was it Malcolm, um, which we don't jump into his head, but he kind of weaves in and out of this story. And yeah. the th- three of them are throwing rocks onto, uh, you know, just onto like a two lane highway and they're big rocks and uh, these jock rednecks hit it and then they get caught. And so there's this kind of battle and this is I can't remember if this is the first time we really see Tyler's power or if we've if we saw it before. But basically, the jocks kind of the jocks stab Tyler and they get in this huge fight and Tyler pulls out his dark magic at one point. And then right after that's when the the jocks all are had committed suicide on the football field. And so, uh, yeah, I don't I can't remember if that is the first time that we kind of realize, oh, this isn't just like kids reading occult books and, you know, pretending that this is something this is like hit Tyler, like doing something and it happening. That was intense. And then there's the bowling alley. So there's a little bowling alley in town that sounds just as dank and janky as you can imagine. Uh, Um <laughs> You mean where Amir just leaves his sister and forgets about her? Yes. Especially you like before that, you get this description of the bowling alley in the arcade where everyone's getting like blowjobs and, and like <laughs> drinking and everything. And he just leaves her there. You're like, yeah. dude, you yeah. are the worst. Oh, and wasn't He's... one of the suicides, a guy tries to or, uh, runs a hose from ex- his exhaust pipe to kill himself in the bowling alley. Yes. Well, yes. that's. Part of the craziness of this town and the craziness of the story is you get these like these random bits where they're like, oh, yeah, we found a car in the parking lot with a hose in it. 
And mm-hmm. like, it's just that, or like we felt like 10 other people committed suicide just the last week or something. And it's like not even part of the main story. It's just these things are happening. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's part of why this message board exists because this town has such an unusually high number of teenage suicides. Like, yes. And adult suicides, just I, suicides altogether. <laughs> I yeah. think when the book begins within like a few months before the school year starts and it's already like their 51st suicide of the year, crazy. it's just a crazy high number and it just keeps growing from there. And we get the idea that these certain occult practices that Tyler is doing are helping to fuel these suicides. Tyler's like the way I kind of saw Tyler was just a complete agent of chaos. Yeah. There's all kinds of weird shit that are going down. Um, And he just wants to fuck around with as many people as he can. Yeah. Like he doesn't give a shit about Amir. He doesn't give a shit about Jill. No. Well, that becomes very apparent at when he's invited to her house for Thanksgiving. Yes. <laughs> oh, the bloody turkey? Yeah. Oh, the dad asks him to help carve the turkey, and Tyler takes the carving knife and chops up his arm a bit and <laughs> pours the blood from his arm all over the Thanksgiving dinner and gets his ass thrown out of the house, <laughs> rightfully so. Well, and that scene, it's interesting because we've – seen Tyler do a couple of his ritual things and the way it's described is when he gets the knife he sort of zones out like so I couldn't tell if if that was fully on purpose or if that was just like he's so used to doing this ritual that when he holds a knife he's it's reflex at that point yeah, yeah. he blanks out and just starts yeah. doing this thing because he first did it when he was doing that like rap thing and yeah. he, cut his, he cut his hand, and like everyone's like, that's fucking awesome! Uh, yeah, it's like this weird <laughs> punk D-beat band that is just a loud, obnoxious <laughs> band in the basement. And it, yeah, he cuts himself in it. He's got some crazy song. It's just like... And his actions, like, it's part of a ritual that he's performing that Jill isn't aware of, but we as readers come to understand pretty quickly that he has some power. And yes. after he does this at Thanksgiving, like it drives his father, Jill's father, to suicide also. Yeah. Well, and that was, he also fucks up Jill's like entire life after that. Yeah. Yeah. I think they get the mother, too. I think at some point, both the mother and the father get sick and they're like spitting up black. Yeah. Yeah. The house falls yeah. into like disrepair. There's like mold and shit growing everywhere. And like. No one notices any problem with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then Tyler I, moves in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was so weird. He like kind of fills in the role of the father. But yeah. He's dating I don't remember. Mother was becomes, there like, something submissive to him? Well, I was going to say, I don't remember. Was there something going on between Tyler and Jill's mother? They, it kind of seemed like maybe there was. If it, if it was, it was off the page, but it just yeah. seemed like. Tyler stepped in and just became the head of the household. Yeah. Which like by the end of the story, you, what you kind of start seeing, and I was wondering this for Tyler is like, he, as much as he kind of jerks around everybody around him, he kind of wants like this control. And so like, I don't know if that was like, like a, like his game was to, I'm going to lead into this so I can control you, Jill. And you know, it didn't work because she eventually just was like, I can't deal with this anymore. But like, especially cause he calls them when they're all adults, he calls them, he sort of calls them back to town. And it, it just feels like, was he trying to, is he kind of like a cult leader without a big cult? And like, he needed these people as much as they sort of needed him. I don't know. And that's what I was wondering with the when him coming in. It it seemed like he was just trying to be like, because there's a couple other times where he sort of plays this like I know what's happening and I like I know all about you, Jill, and I know everything that's happening, kind of that you don't want me to know about. Because it's definitely the rituals seem like because we get dream we get a lot of dream parts where it seems like he he's manipulating and he's watching everything like because there is a scene where it is where jill's dad is in the dream and like falling apart and like we get lose kind of in these dreams but in the background and it's just 
super weird, and I'm not quite sure what that all was kind of leading us to believe. Well, it isn't quite <laughs> – it's not quite dreams as no? much as it is time travel. You yeah. think so? Yeah, I, I'd say it's more on the time travel side and with a side of astral projection that's kind of going on. Yeah. Uh, Later on in the book, Lou becomes a user of Whirl and starts doing the occult practices also. And we see there's a few times early on where it notes that when he's in these dream spaces, he's free of the machinery and he's pulling wires off of himself. Yeah. Which at first I thought was kind of like a riff on the Matrix. Yeah. But But by the end of it, you realize that it's Lou as an elder who is traveling through these dream states into the past from the future. He, she is disconnecting from the machines that are keeping her alive in the hospital as an old woman and going back into these states like the time isn't a, a linear time. It's more like a loop. So when she gets amped up on world, she's able to go back and view these things that are happening and try to affect some kind of change, huh. I think. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, by the end of this book, it's completely psychedelic. And yeah, it's super wacky. <laughs> weird and occasionally horrifying. Some of the imagery that Jaeger pumps into that <laughs> finale. Yeah. It gets like really philosophical, too. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot of that in there. In some ways, it reminded me of House of Leaves. But less pretentious. Oh, yeah, I mean, it, <laughs> thankfully, this is on the Kindle. I don't know what the print copy is like, but it doesn't have like footnotes and a bibliography. You don't have to hold it upside down <laughs> in a mirror to read it. But it does have that kind of feel to it. You know, it has that kind of tone where you get all of these brief detours into the message board posts and news articles that kind of tell you what's happening. But the head hopping primarily is what for me kind of gave it that feel even though house of leaves doesn't head hop a lot i don't know it just it felt of a similar experimental style the way he kind of plays with the narrative which and this is where i kind of was checking out was the last like third of the book because it feels very repetitive and it just felt like a lot of and i get taking time away from it and kind of looking at that ending like you because like it was so hard to tell if it was dream like it had to have been dreams slash jumping into and all that random stuff but it felt like we were getting a lot of the same things over and over and over again that last little bit and i was just like okay i get it they're adults now and they, they kind of have this crappy life and they keep jumping into this ritual thing and like it just for me, it kept happening until they till they finally get called back. But before they get called back to the town and sort of like after college for Jill, a lot of that felt like it probably could have been trimmed up, at least in my opinion. It just it didn't seem like it was going anywhere. Yeah, well, I mean, that's also that's also part of like the structure of it, too, where it's like we're unsure because once Lou starts doing the ritual, that's when it gets all kind of fucky. Yeah. And by the end, it makes sense that, oh, this is Lou, like, time traveling. Yeah. Yeah. Like, this is is Lou, in a sense, escaping the linear linear aspects of time and gaining all the possible knowledge that she can gain. And we also see that she's looking over her friends, or even, like, her former friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how she desperately was doing what she can to protect them, but ultimately couldn't. What Lou is doing kind of ties into very early. (laughs) Well, yeah, it ties into what Tyler is doing, but there's a more philosophical look at it very early on. I think it was when the football players they find hanged from the goalposts. They remark on the loop of the rope. And there's a quote there that the loop is everything that is happening or was happening or will happen. The loop meets itself and either it ends or it starts again. Which on the surface of it is just a fairly deep examination of suicide by hanging. 
and whether or not there's life after death or just death. But it also reflects on what Lou is doing uh, when she does this whirl. She's able to go back and look at everything that has happened or what will happen. And if she can either start this again or end it. That makes sense. Because, yeah, I mean, like, definitely in those early dreams, you get that. Either you get her taking the, the stuff out or there's that the window, which makes sense if she's, like, in a hospital. Maybe people are looking at her through a window and there's, like, a little – Is and I think, Rich, you were talking last week when we were talking about this, that the voice in the box that she keeps hearing, that was her voice. Yep. Which is, Yeah. It's interesting because, yeah, those dreams, they're def- or whatever they are, trances, they're definitely like follow that logic because it's just like this kind of jump through stuff happening. And a lot happens at the abandonment. There's a house in the abandonment that's like a cone. And I guess that's a good question. With all of that, what is what's the deal with that and Tyler? Is that are we saying that Tyler was looking at his future when he was in there? In, or what? I'd say a little bit, but it's also like part of that cone as well. Like Tyler, out of everyone, he's the one who's like abusing Whirl. Yes. Right. So like Whirl, like Lou uses Whirl, for lack of a better term, responsibly. <laughs> like Whirl's part of Lou's ritual, but even in doing the ritual that Lou has to do daily, this kind of opens up Lou to understanding what time itself is and how time itself works and kind of opens up Lou's perspective to like a bigger concept of what's happening in their town and what's happening with the people that she knows. But the difference is Tyler's on world 24 seven. Yeah. Like, I don't think we ever see Tyler with leaves, not in his mouth. Yeah. And I think by the abuse of Whirl, this has put Tyler onto a totally different playing field where he can both escape the linearity of time and escape his own body. And And I think it's also a way for him to reconnect with his father. Yeah, because his father committed suicide a long time ago. Yeah. I think Tyler is using Whirl to both do that but also take out his anger on the town and take out his frustration on the town. And even though like Jill and Amir were his friends, he's still taking out his anger and frustration on them, which we see when he invites them back to the town through dreams, through dreams and through a phone call. Yeah. We see the horrible things that happened to them when they return. And I feel that was all orchestrated by Tyler who doesn't want anyone to have a happy ending because he was denied his with his father. So everyone who has a connection to this town in some way has to be punished. I mean, I could be totally wrong, but that's (laughs) that's the way I see it. Yeah. That makes sense because it does seem like he, he wants this fucked up family with Jill and Amir, but then he also either he, it's so interesting because like their paths, Definitely, like, Jill, like, I'm trying to think if Amir's past, like, or present or future kind of gets better. Because, like, at first, Jill goes off to college, and it takes some time, you know, I think it was after Tyler committed suicide, that she kind of moves on and is kind of in a better place. Um, I mean, Lou seems like he's in a better, or she's in a better place. But I'm trying to think with Amir, because I know he he stays in town for a while and then he ends up leaving to live with his brother. And he I try to remember what he ends up doing, but it like so anyway, I guess what I'm trying to wonder is like if if Tyler saw all of that and was mad and brings them back to punish them. Because they're all older when they come back for those listening. And I'm sh- I can't even remember. What does he end up doing with both of them? <laughs> Jill gets into that relationship with yes. that girl at her college. Yeah. And they get into the car accident where yes. her girlfriend dies. That's right. Um, Amir comes back and his sister's like, the fuck are you doing? Yeah. And he's like, you call me back. And then she's like, I didn't do shit. And then he meets with his friend and they go to that cabin. Yes. And what happened to the friend? I can't 
I'm trying Amir, to remember. <laughs> Amir ends up bashing the guy's head in with a yeah. shovel. Yeah, I knew, I knew he died. Yeah, so Amir kills him. But I can't remember why. <laughs> I'm hazy on it, too. It's kind of – it's been a little not, bit since I read this. Yes. I, have to. I have the book open, so. Oh, good. Well, that'll help. <laughs> People are like, what is happening? <laughs> we read this book because it is long. It's like 360 pages long or something like that. And I, so, read, I read this book – I finished it at the beginning of the month. Yeah, I think that's right around when I did, too, because – Okay, so here I think this is where it goes. It's uh, oh, is it because he got attacked by geese? And <laughs> that, that deals with it, but it's like a mirror. It says Cindy's here in a round room. Cindy's skin emptied of muscle, blood, and even bone. She hangs in the air like a rag with an awful wide smile on her flat, billowing face. Her voice speaks in my head like a bad signal or crumbling ice. I bet you feel real fucking stupid, she said. I try to talk, but my jaw is too loose, disconnected from the rest of my face. I feel real fucking stupid. Do you remember this place? Yeah. I don't know what she's talking about. Real fucking stupid. Yeah? I know where you are. I know who you're with. You should feel so fucking stupid. And with her last word, her body crumples and ebbs to the floor like a feather. I woke up to Marlon screaming. I jumped up and pushed backward into a corner. I couldn't stop looking at it. The figure standing over Marlon, I thought it was a person at first, but it's shape. It's shape. It wasn't one thing but many. Bound, tethered, compressed into one. A mass of writhing black and beige things fluttering and curling. A body made of other bodies, pulsing oval bodies, ragged wings, and brown, r- red, drippy faces with their beaks snapped off, stuck together, forming a torso and flailing limbs. Dozens of geese piled up and fused together into the shape of a person. It pinned Marlin to the floor, its arms of twisting necks banging against his body like feathery black eels. Marlin flailed, kicking two geese free. They flew back and slapped the floor, seizing before snapping upright, twisting their necks toward me and mewling. I got to get back to my feet and ran down the hall and found the first one of the door pushed through it and slammed behind me. I pressed my body against the door, weeping, whispering, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, while Marlon and the geese screamed through the walls. Then he comes back and the geese were gone, but Marlon is covered in uh, blood, piss, and bird shit, quoting from the book. <laughs> and his bones were all fucked up. And Amir puts him out of his misery with a cinder block. That's right. Uh, my favorite part of this whole ending section is uh, Lou's chapter, like shortly after that happens, when Lou's talking to the dot. And it's like, the dot asks if I'd like to hear my life turn into a parable. I laugh a little and say yes. Then let's tell a story. The dot's voice shifts to a British accent. Let's say that once upon a time, there was a village, and in that village there was a woman who no one could see, though everyone knew she was there. Often the villagers would speak to the woman as they went about their days, as one might speak to an angel or a minor god. Each villager gave her a different name and kept that name close to themselves, never sharing it with another. They spoke to her about their quarrels, and she would listen, whispering their quarrels back to herself, devouring each problem as though they were jelly beans. From these quarrels, she uh, she spun a golden silk ladder that stretched all the way to heaven. From the top of the rung, she could see the gods, Silver Quip, the Fancy, Bonzol, the Vengeful, and Stalin, the Lover. But still, she was too far away for them to hear their voice. She, like all other mortals, was no greater than the flea to the gods. But she stayed up there past the clouds, atop her golden ladder, shouting at the titans in vain until she grew old and gray. What did I yell? I say. The dot doesn't say anything for a few moments. Finally, she asked them to keep the villagers safe, for they knew not what they did. And what did the titans do? They didn't listen. And no matter how loud she yelled, she grew very old. And on her 91st birthday, she fell from the ladder, dying before hitting the ground. I laughed. So what's the moral? Another pause. And then, one day, no one will ever know you were here. (laughs) Like, I don't know why, but I just love that part of the book. Yeah. But yeah, like, even, like, this ends, the the book even ends with Jill just kind of, like, by herself, alone in this town, 
and she can kind of feel like Tyler and she can see what's going on. But I think by the end of it, it's their lives have been so corrupted by the town and by Tyler that they can, they can never escape it. Yeah. It's definitely that. I mean, it's like I was saying, it's definitely that commentary. It's real hard to escape where you're from, no matter what you do You're You're always going to be tainted by that. You know, the one thing we didn't really talk about was all the little black worms that everyone saw, the black lines. Yeah. Um, it, it all is tied to the world, but like when they start chewing it, they see black lines coming from people's faces and, and twirling around from the sky. And it's really interesting imagery and kind of what it's lot tying into. I, I did like that. That was a nice touch. We also didn't talk very much about the dead baby jokes that Tyler. Oh God! Wants to share. <laughs> so, Mike, what's worse? What's worse than a ten no. dead baby stapled no. to ten trees? What? One dead baby stapled to ten trees. <laughs> That's so terrible. <laughs> you never told you those get? jokes in high school, Matt. Oh God! I I heard all of them in high school. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> What do you get when you throw a baby in a box no. of knives down a flight of stairs? No. What? An erection. <laughs> I am not tied to any of that, people. <laughs> you can write your complaints to them. <laughs> oh, man. oh, man. I mean, you know, that perfectly captures teenagers, those jokes. I feel, I feel like even though these teenagers are abusing substances, like more so than the normal – teenager would i think oh yeah these guys a really are like, good job of like what it was to be a teenager yes. yeah these guys are like hardcore drug abusers they're like two steps away from being crackheads yeah. pretty much i mean they work with crazy bob and his, <laughs> his, his wackiness also yeah, I mean, Amir at one point becomes employed as a drug dealer under the bridge <laughs> yeah. yeah what happened to to lou when like the police officer found Lou in the hole. Oh, okay. yeah. That we was like, happens. what the fuck? That was brutal. The police in this town are not good people either. Like, I mean, they're cops, though, so that's a good thing. <laughs> I like that one of them, from like the time he was 14, started like doing self-tattoos yeah. and was putting swastikas on his body and then grows up to become a cop. Like, yeah, yeah I can see that. That's yeah. That's appropriate. And I then mean, ends just, up becoming a pedophile by the end. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. it's full circle. Yeah, it's just a capture. Like, every, there's no shining moments in this book. They even talk about, at one point, Jill's uncle, like, is hitting on Jill, and it's just really gross. And it's just, there's no bright spots. It, no, this is an unremittingly bleak read from beginning to end. Like, yeah. it is, it's just dark the whole way through. Yes, it's just, it's, oh God, it's like going through it. You just feel so depressed after reading it. But I was like, I need to finish this. I mean, the dead baby jokes are the most lighthearted this thing gets. <laughs> <Yeah>. So... <laughs> Oh man. Yeah. It, it, you know, it, besides the, like I said, besides the part that I felt like dragged out a little too long, it, it's a good book. It deals with a lot of stuff. The prose is on point. Everything is hits exactly what it needs to hit. And it's a very bleak book, but yeah. So I, I enjoyed it up until just that part of just like, it just, everyone was kind of all doing their rituals. So every head job, jump was like oh well now Lou's in front of the candle and then it jumps and then Jill and her girlfriend are in front of the candle and then Amir is depressed in California and then let's go back oh Lou's back doing the candle thing and it's just like I get it (laughs) you know it's funny that you had a problem with the repetitious nature of it in that regard it is repetitious and it kind of reminded me of the cipher Although I liked it more here. <laughs> yes. Is Whereas very the much cipher like I found insufferably repetitious, but yes. that exactly what it reminded me of where, I mean, and I like the cipher. I, I would probably put them on the same level for me. They're both gritty. They both make you feel like you need to take a shower after reading them. 
But yeah, they both have that where like we get the point of what's happening. We don't need more. Um, you know, you don't need to keep showing us these things. You can move on and take us to Tyler calling them back. And that was the same for Decipher. It's like, yes, we get it. The hole is dirty. And these people love the hole. Got to love the hole. <laughs> Now, I know we put a trigger warning on the start of this episode. Reading this, did, if we can get personal for a minute, did either of you guys feel triggered by any of this? No. Okay. Not, no. I mean, like... But it, I, a lot of people do get triggered by, like, matches of suicide, and we didn't describe the suicide in this book, but, yeah. like, and it's, it's a lot. <laughs> a, a lot, yeah. A lot of it happens, but you don't... What you don't see, and I think it was good, is you don't see the um, the act. You only catch the after effect of it. Yeah, I don't remember yeah. seeing any of it. So the, actually. There, there's there's no suicide described being passed out. You you do get the description of like Tyler cutting himself. Yes. Yes. Yeah. As like, far as the suicides, there's a degree of separation. You're using either viewing it through Lou, who is seeing it on a message board. Yeah. Or you're seeing it from Tyler as a discovery, or you're hearing about it from third-hand accounts of news reports or people who have been to the bridge and saw a body. Yeah. And, like, the message boards, you bring that up, and they – kind of at the beginning, there's a lot of talk about people finding things online on how to do it, mm-hmm. like how much pills you can take and and different things like that. So, you know, I, I think that's a good commentary on what what is out there, especially for parents of teens. I'm not a parent of a teen, um, but, it, you know, it's it, that part is I don't know, Mike, if you were feeling maybe not yet because your kids aren't old, older. But with my two, I mean, they're not at the cusp of teenage years, but you can't help but read this and just be very worried for the future. <laughs> oh yeah. Just, yeah. No, like, there's a definite part of that where it's like, it's, yeah. I am definitely not ready to deal with the high school issues that yes. they're going to be facing with being introduced to drugs and alcohol and teenage sex. And it's just like, yeah, I'm, I'm good with them just being toddler <laughs> age right now. I, I have enough problems with, <laughs> where we're at currently as toddlers, I don't need to go and start freaking out about high school stuff. Yeah. It's, but I mean, it's, it's going to be different problems for different years anyway. You know? it's yeah, like, it's very, very true. <laughs> it's like, okay, let's get through the three major terrorist tornado <laughs> bullshit that we've got right now. Yeah. Yeah. So high that, school is a long ways off. Thank God. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that part was tough. Like, Reading about, you know, that wasn't that's not triggering of me, but it's definitely like, oh, man, it just makes you worried about the future <laughs> because a lot of that is in there. And yeah. and again, we've repeatedly said this is a bleak book, so it does not make it one doesn't pull any punches on that kind of stuff. And two, it doesn't sugarcoat what these teens are viewing and or doing or reading so that, you know can make it a little tough to see. Yeah. It's like some of this definitely rang true from my own high school experiences of people that I had been friends with at that point who had taken different detours in life and pretty much let themselves be taken over by drug abuse and dropped out of school to become dealers or transferred to other schools because they were getting into too much hardcore shit and their parents intervened. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there's definitely those points where it's like, yeah, you know, if I would have stayed around this guy, I, this might've been a bigger problem. Thankfully yeah. I didn't. Yeah. I made those better choices cause I didn't want to become a crackhead. And yeah. then, yeah, there's at that point, like you just hope that you're able to instill in your kids enough self-respect and they they become conscientious of what they're doing and make decisions responsibly. Yes. But, you know, there's always going to be that temptation and no matter how good of a parent you are, <laughs> that is yeah. uh, 
there's still all this shit out there that can snap them up pretty easily. Exactly. Because, I mean, definitely that's what you see in this is Tyler is this very charismatic person who, like, for Jill, uh, at first you don't get uh, – what I thought was interesting on for the Jill story is – you're because you're seeing kind of Amir and Tyler, and you don't spend a lot of time at first in any of their houses except maybe Tyler's basement, but, like – you see, once you kind of get into what Jill's home life is like, you kind of realize like, okay, they're not much like everyone else in this town. They're not well off. They're kind of this, you know, low income type of family. But like, it seemed like she had a pretty good connection with her parents. I mean, she was teenage, so she kind of had that usual rebellious against a parent. Um, but like, you get a lot of references of like them singing meatloaf songs and them going out and doing all these different things. And so it's this kind of interesting look at what a person like Tyler can do, because like you don't what they first meet at that that place that we talked about, like at the hospital or whatever like that. And it's just through basic Tyler's personality that grabs Jill and gets her hooked on this guy, because like you see it throughout she's like obsessed with him and and it it, it, you know it's an interesting topic because like you see her constantly texting him and he only texts every once in a while and every time he does text she clings on on to that so it's kind of that look at somebody who is obsessed with somebody and what that other person Tyler can do because he knew he was playing that game. You could see them playing that. He was playing that game with both Amir and, and Jill of kind of leading them both on so he could kind of manipulate and control them. So it's, it's that interesting look of high school and relationships in that, where it seems like, okay, you're only in high school. It doesn't need to be this intense. (laughs) (laughs) Got your whole life ahead of you. Anyway, negative space. It no is poo, no poo sticks. Yeah, there's no poo. There is poop though. There is poop. <laughs> yes, there is. <laughs> Surprise! Matt didn't get it five stars just on that basis. <laughs> yeah, you got you got the brown sludge running down the hang oh, people's God. legs. It's, yeah, <laughs> not the kind of poop I like. <laughs> prefer it more solid is that what you're saying <laughs> oh man yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> well i will say this book was a hell of a read i want to thank matt bartlett again for having me pull the trigger to buy it because i would not have even heard of this book if like i didn't see matt bartlett post about it yeah i literally heard nothing about this until you started talking about it yeah, like I had no idea this existed until I saw the Facebook post Matt did, and I was like, this cover is really cool. Yeah. I'll give it a go. And <laughs> like I was completely enthralled in the book, and it's really one of the best books I've read this year. Yeah, I actually bought this when it came out knowing nothing at all about it because it doesn't have like a plot description. Uh, if you just go to the Kindle page, it was just a couple of poll quotes, uh, yeah. other author blurbs. But I think it was on sale, and that cover was enough yeah. to get me to pull the trigger. And then I just kind of forgot about it until we <laughs> decided <laughs> to do this episode after Rich started reading it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, definitely a great read. I'm glad that I ended up being able to get to this when I did. Yes, definitely. Well, I'm glad you both en- – I don't know if enjoyed is a good word to use with this book, but I'm glad you no. both had – I'm glad you both got something out of this. It's. I want to read his other book just because his writing is really, really good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like as soon as I finish this one, I put the other one in my Amazon cart, and <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm gonna get it one of these days. It looks like it's <laughs> only in paperback, but I am very curious to see what else he does. Me too. Unfortunately, I can't rush right into that one because after this book, I do need a break from. Yeah, Mr. that Yager's was point of view. <laughs> yeah, that was. That was. Uh, it's a heavy book and a heavy it philosophy. Is. But, yeah, um, it is. It's not a light read. No. Although it's, it oddly it moves fast, but it is not a light read. It's yeah. really hard to put down. Yeah. 
it's one of those train wreck kind of books, you know, where it's like (laughs) you want to keep looking at it and you kind of slow down to look at it, but it's also something that's repulsive. Yeah. And you just need to keep going. (laughs) (laughs) Um, this was, this was, this was a productive discussion we had. Not as much poop talk as I was expecting. <laughs> I honestly have like t- kind of blanked out any poop stuff in this one. <laughs> Next reads, we'll have to highlight poop passages. <laughs> yes. To comment on. Our next novel, we'll have to we'll have to look for for the poop stuff. <laughs> yeah, we'll probably have to put a different kind of warning on that episode. <laughs> Maybe just a little. <laughs> Matt's gonna start jerking off, and it's gonna be oh, a problem. God, no. Matt, oh, that's why your keyboard's so sticky. (laughs) It's all that weird tapping on the microphone. (laughs) Oh, my Lord. No. Need trigger warning for that. I will say I do want to give a thank you to our listening audience. Thanks Uh, for putting up with our shit. (laughs) Yeah. It's also our last last, um, two months as of this recording. (laughs) We cracked a thousand downloads each month. Yeah. And we are spreading that abyss. Yeah. This, this, this was really big for us. And I want to thank the audience for spreading the abyss around as much as you can. And if you're a first time listener or a return listener, we want to make sure you review that podcast and do what you can to spread that abyss around because the abyss needs to consume all. And uh, Michael, where can our listeners follow you at? Uh, they can follow me on Twitter at Mike H five eight five six, or uh, they can also block me on Twitter <laughs> at Mike H five eight five six. Is that a is that is that a reference to uh, what I think it's a reference to? <laughs> Maybe it could be. <laughs> Gone Matt, from shit posting you? to shit talking. <laughs> a lot of shit in this episode is what I'm saying. <laughs> Just a bit. <laughs> Uh, um, uh, okay. I'm on Twitter at, uh, Brandenburg DM. All right. And you can follow me at Twitter at Rudy five through the 88 and make sure to follow our podcast at into staring. This is wanna, Richard Gerlach. Well, say, hold on. Uh, hey, do you want to tell them about next week's episode? Yeah. I'd like to uh, know. <laughs> Cause I have no idea. Oh, yeah. So we're going to be doing the communion of saints by John Langan. Cool. And we're going to be speaking with Patrick Barb, who was one of the uh, winners of the Hollywood Short Story Contest that Divin- Divination House uh, Reviews did for a few months ago, actually. <laughs> that was so. a very good prepared statement. <laughs> it was, wasn't it? It's like, I, it's like I, I practiced it or something. I was hanging on every baited breath. <laughs> But, What's he going to so, say next? Yeah. Keep staring. <laughs> we, we, we shut him down. <laughs> System needs to reboot. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But no, so next week will be the Communion of the Saints by John Lankin. And make sure you tune in for that. It'll be a really fun discussion. And I always love talking about some John Lankin. Yes. Yes, indeed. Oh, this is Richard Gerlach saying keep staring. The Necrocasticon, where we blend horror and metal for your pleasure, and ours, with special guests from horror and metal, with host Smoke and Walt Ball, ah! Thomas R. Clark, well, that was sort of like Paul trying to get laid. Mr. Scott Reacts, you don't have to pay for it, which I think is ridiculous, Sergeant Fury Dan Roberts, and Uncle Skip Novak, train, train. and where can you find the Necrocasticon, Sergeant Fury, wherever you get your fine-ass podcasts, Mondays on Project Entertainment Network. This has been a presentation of the Project Entertainment Network.